Welcome everyone to another webinar of Bezma Lamakuf University. Today's topic is very critical and we will be discussing the change in medical education post COVID era with our distinguished faculty and guests. And my dear colleague, Professor Luciana Sasso will be helping me to moderate this session. And we'll right away start with uh, Professor Özçelik. Uh, who's a great friend of mine and the faculty of Vesmailem Vakuf University. Let me just introduce her to you. Uh, she started her residency in the field of medical microbiology at Jum Jumhuriyet University in 1982, and then completed her master's and her doctorate in 1988 uh, at the same university. In 1997, she received a full professorship and she has been working with us at the university since 2016. She also has interest in medical education and completed her master's degree in international and comparative uh, education uh, very recently. And she's been working as a member of the commission for setting standards in the National Medical Education Accreditation Board since 2015. And she has many publications over microbiology, but also about medical education. And it's my honor to introduce her. And the floor is yours, Simranja. Thank you for your introduce. I can share my. Is it seen? No. Actually, okay. we couldn't see okay. now. Okay. If you could just make it full screen, it will be better. Okay. If possible. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I would like to briefly introduce my faculty first. Uh, briefly, <laughs> one slide. Uh, Bezme Adam Vakuf University and uh, Bezme Adam School of Medicine is originated uh, from a hospital established in Istanbul in 1845. Uh, in, uh, in Turkey, medical education has a six year education period. The first three years consist of pre clinic and uh, the fourth and fifth grades consist of the clinical period. The sixth grade consists of an education process that includes exactly 12 uh, months as an internship. In our uh, faculty, uh, in our education, uh, system-based uh, and horizontal vertical integration model is applied. Education in our faculty consists of two semesters in each academic year. Uh, for this reason, I want to cover what, uh, uh, what we did during the pandemic by semester. In January 2019, we were accred accredited by the National Medical Education Accreditation Board. Uh, board. Uh, and what happened uh, in education during the pandemic in Turkey and what we did? Uh, on March 11, COVID was declared uh, a global pandemic uh, from World Health Organization. Distance education uh, decision of Turkish Higher Council. Uh, Distance education period has started at Bezme Alam Bakıp University School of Medicine with the higher decision of higher education council regarding, uh, regarding the distance education method of universities for the 2019-2020 uh, academic year spring semester. At the beginning of the, uh, this period, and uh, in pandemic, we did not have sufficient preparations for distance education and uh, or online education yet. However, we were able to switch to distance education approximately uh, within two weeks. The main problem was to get the faculty members to adapt 
to the system. Another problem was how many students, how many of the students had internet access. With all this in mind, we had to set off quickly. First of all, in order to compensate for the educational activities, to cover uh, the week of uh, March 16 to uh, 23, uh, the course contents were immediately uploaded to the Learn Based Mealem, uh, edu.tr uh, distance education portal, as presentation files, uh, lecture notes, etc., materials in form of a slide. A slide presentation or PDF and presented to our uh, students asynchronously. In the system, uh, it can be seen whether the students have opened the slides of the lessons and how long they have completed the lesson. As of March 23, educational activities continue with the presentation file. Uh, lecture notes, audio video recording of the course contents. At the same time, at the uh, Bezme Alem Education Commission uh, meeting uh, was done. And it was decided that the departments and the faculty secretariat, uh, secretariat uh, student affairs and information processing directories should work in cooperation in order to carry out the process effectively. Technical support was provided in this uh, process. I spring link was shared with faculty instructors, uh, instructors via uh, email. Uh, online training was provided by uh, Bezme Alem IT department. For those who could not attend the training videos were recorded, uh, recorded and shared with the faculty members. For our faculty instructors who could not record audio and or uh, video um, from their own computers uh, in the environment where they were living, cameras and microphones were installed in our uh, objective structured clinical examination laboratory rooms. Upon the extension of the interruption of education and training due to the COVID-19 synchronous education was started after March 30. In addition to asynchronous education, in order to increase interaction with students and create an Enrollment for questions and answers by ensuring their active participation in the course. While most of the courses proceeded in parallel with the academic calendar, some of them were conducted retrospectively. After the distance education process started, it was observed that 30% of the course subjects were taught with both asynchronous and synchronous distance education methods in all classes. It was found that it was more beneficial for the students to learn first asynchronous and then synchronously. The clinical skills that could not be performed were carried out in a short and concentrated manner during the summer period. Also, despite pandemic, some interns voluntarily wanted to complete 12 months in the clinics face to face in summer. During the assessment and evaluation pass, uh, the summative exams held at the end of the committee in the preclinics were made online by take, taking the necessary preparations. Uh, in the clinical period, only online theoretical exams were held. PBL, case-based education, unfortunately, uh, could not be done. Again, uh, objective structured clinical examination, which we used to evaluate students, could not be done. In this process, we implemented feedback survey uh, also, uh, evaluating the 
effectiveness of the models we use regarding distance education system on course, learning and exam success. When uh, we came 2020 and 2021 fall semester, what we did uh, during this period, face-to-face -face training was started in fall due to the decrease in COVID cases in Turkey. However, as a new way went into uh, full closure again in October, distance education was started again. Due to too uh, much uh, data loading, it was necessary to switch to a new digital uh, platform and the distance education system uh, switch to Microsoft Teams. The trainings of this uh, program were given to both academicians and students, and it was maintained completely synchronously. In addition, videos of the practical lessons in the pre clinic were taken and uploaded to the system. The fourth and fifth grade clinical skills lessons were continued by taking necessary precautions and reducing it to two or three hours a day. In this process, internal education continued uh, uninterrupted face to face. I came uh, 2020, 2021 spring semester. semester. In January 2021, all health personnel academies, the fourth, the fifth graders, and interns started to be vaccinated. However, first, second, and third year students could not be vaccinated during this period. For this reason, while courses were carried out face-to-face uh, -face in the spring semester, the pre clinical had to continue with distance education entirely. All small group studies in the pre clinical education program were rearranged and performed on the online platform. In this process, all small group activities such as Article R's, uh, PBR's, uh, Saisons, uh, and Evidence-Based uh, Medicine Saisons were successfully, careful, uh, successfully carried out on the digital platform, and all events are recorded. In this process, both uh, formative and summative exams and evaluation of small group activities were used in assessment and evaluation in the pre clinic Online exams were held by taking the necessary precautions. Since objective structured clinical examination could not be held in the clinic, online oral exams were started. I came 2021 and 2022 fall semester, what, uh, what we did. Uh, during this period, almost all of our academics and students were vaccinated at least two doses. Uh, for this reason, all professional courses started to be held face to face, except for some uh, common courses uh, and elective courses, for example. Uh, history we are trying to revert to our old order in education and evaluation in the clinical period objective structured clinical examination clinical assessments uh, case-based sessions etc started face to face in this season, all professionals with small groups and practices continue face to face in the preclinical period. In conclusion, we found that the blended model applied for the same core subject was more beneficial for students. Uh, however, 
It was not possible distance education in practical and internship practices, although videos on skills and practices were recorded and uploaded to the system to replace formal education. In addition, distance education for theoretical courses has limitations, such as not being able to provide face-to-face -face interaction and not being able to instantly solve the difficulties encountered in the learning process. Limitations in conducting theoretical and especially practical exams are also an important disadvantage. Normal times, distance education in medical education can only be used as a support to formal education. As a result of all these evaluations and the experiences we have gained in the COVID-19 COVID pandemic, we think that synchronous to asynchronous distance education applications will develop further over time and contribute to medical education. Uh, this is what I want to say in summary for uh, pandemic uh, process. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Semra Ojan, for uh, summarizing what we have been doing during this COVID pandemic. And Luciana, now it's your turn. So uh, good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, many thanks uh, to Professor Rumeza Kazanchoklu, uh, Vice Chancellor of Basilem University, for the invitation to co chair this uh, session with her. And uh, thank you also to the first speaker for the very interesting talk. Now we move uh, to the second speaker, uh, Professor Iskander uh, Sayek. Uh, very briefly, uh, Professor Sayek served. Uh, as council member of Surgical Infection Society uh, in the years 1990-1996 and was elected as president in 1997. He also served as a president at Ankara Medical Chamber, Ankara Surgical Society and Turkish Surgical Society. He served as dean of Acetepe University School of Medicine between 2000 and 2006. Currently is chairing Turkish Medical Association Coordination Committee of uh, Medical Specialty Society, and uh, uh, also presiding the Accreditation Association of Medical Education Programs in Turkey. Very important, I think, for this webinar is that he was involved in the preparation of the World Federation for Medical Education Standards. So please, uh, Professor Sayek, uh, the floor is yours. Could we ask... Oh, yeah. Uh, Professor Soy, can you unmute yourself, please? Thank you. I am extremely sorry, you know, this... Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for the invitation and being part of this webinar. Uh, today, uh, I'd like to discuss various aspects of the effects of COVID-19, uh, both socially and on medical education globally, uh, the response of the schools to the pandemic, and uh, at the transformative effect of uh, the pandemic on medical education with future scenario. And I will shortly give you some information what happened uh, in Turkey generally, and then conclude with a couple of slides on uh, my view on future of medical education. Uh, the effect of COVID-19 pandemic uh, was really an unprecedented toll on, especially on healthcare forces and workers and increase the workload of the uh, healthcare workers with leading to 
really significant effects, uh, diminishing the trust in the globalized world uh, and focusing on the significance of healthcare systems because none of the, in none of the countries globally, uh, the healthcare system was really ready for this uh, pandemic and emergency case. Uh, now, the, certainly it has some negative effects. Uh, the most important one related to our topic today was this, the disruption of medical education continuity at all levels, both undergraduate, graduate, and uh, CME and CPD uh, activities. Uh, but there are some positive effects. Uh, among these was, uh, I think, which is related to our topic today are really recognizing the importance of preventive medicine and that we should really stress on this in our medical education, increased awareness on the curriculum overload in the medical schools. I think the medical schools now are aware that really what we have been doing since years, that the curriculum is overloaded and it could be um, at least diminished for some part, you know. And the other issue was that increased online education, as we heard uh, earlier from Dr. Semra, uh, where the undergraduate, postgraduate, and CME CPD activities could be done on online uh, or on remote uh, activities. The medical education specifically, there was a, it was a major disruptive change uh, around the world at all stages. Uh, there was uncertainty related to how long this pandemic was going to last. And the other issue, which I think was important, that the long-term impact was not predictable. We still really do not know how much this pandemic is going to affect our medical education on long term. Uh, on long term. Now, the under medical, undergraduate medical education uh, mainly uh, suspension of the education and in-hospital clinical training took over uh, globally and in Turkey as well. And this was mainly related to minimizing the personal contact to mitigate and to contain the disease, decrease the risk of the students from getting the infection because they were not vaccinated yet, and lack of personal protective equipment and the cost although uh, now over the past years, this has been really taken care of uh, globally. Uh, the medical schools had to invent new ways uh, to educate out the necessity, mainly on emergency basis. What was done really, act, the schools acted very fast, as we heard in two weeks, uh, from Bezmalem University that they started online education immediately. And um, now we know that these methods may have been, may have staying long power than go well beyond the pandemic and reshape uh, our education for training tomorrow's doctors. The current response to the pandemic has been the increased awareness and adopt adoption of currently available technologies in medical education at all stages, as I said. And the main aim was his was really mainly provision of medical education and in continuity. The online classes have become a key component in the continuity of education globally and uh, in Turkey as well. Now, what happened during the pandemic shortly, face-to-face uh, -face education was moved to virtual education. Now, in this case, the traditional medical education or on-campus live lectures and clinical training was suspended. And in the preclinical years, various activities, which included remote lectures, pre-recorded lectures, voiced over PowerPoint presentations, small group interactive sessions, anatomy turned to be only video on video dissection by the faculty and the students were not involved uh, and lacking of clinical hands-on training. Whereas on clinical years, 
uh, we had remote lectures. And again, everything was remote for a period. Now, this uh, beginning of 2021, 2022, uh, it has returned to normal almost. Remote grand rounds, morning reports, reports, and remote patient presentations. So everything really was on remote uh, uh, position where uh, it could be either done synchronously or asynchronously already has been discussed. Now with these, the faculty unfortunately devoted more time to patient care than teaching. It had to be that way because there was a workload of service in the schools as well. And we really have to challenge some issues related to this where uh, creating a loss of collaborative experiences, a significant detriment to education, where this could be handled uh, by interactive small group discussions, case-based education, team-based education, where we learn during the process uh, in a completely new and innovative manner for the students and educators, uh, which they are not used to, had to be implemented. The clerkships were canceled and skill acquisition and relation building was really not done. So the, uh, I think here it was very important uh, to support the students and the educators for adoption of these uh, changes in medical education. Now, increased use of technology in healthcare and medical education was the main uh, uh, final outcome of this process uh, where the, they had to continue the medical education where would allow the students to develop collaborative skills and improve adaptability. Here, I'd like to stress on the generation difference because this generation or the millennium generation or even now the Z, Z generation is learning in a different manner than the older generations. And this state was compensated by their adaptation with this and competency in interprofessional collaboration and telemedicine has been really a good way to improve their educational aspects. We learned many things from this quick adaptation of medical schools to a remote virtual curricula during the, the pandemic. The profound effects unfortunately may forever change uh, how future physicians are educated in certain areas and the long-term the outcome and results of these changes in medical schools on students um, is really yet currently unknown. But we need more time, I think, to find out about these changes. What will happen after the pandemic or what has happened really, we have really to, we had a good experience during the pandemic, which I think is was very important we should take some lessons from this by evaluating what we did and how we did it and how much we were successful. With, uh, with this, uh, I think we should stress that technology should be used in medical education to enhance teaching and learning, but we have to use this in rationality, within rationality on a rational basis. Uh, and uh, we need to have some transformational changes in medical education to cope with emergency situations in the future as well. For this, maybe we could think of adoptive learning, which leads to personalized lead learning, which I think the learning anytime, anywhere with extended reality would be in the future uh, used in medical education more commonly. Now, the future scenario for medical education, I think, relies on the use of technology and face-to-face -face teaching and learning together, where this should be integrated properly. And uh, for this, we have the blended learning or blended education, where we could use this technology uh, with face-to-face -face teaching and learning integrated properly, so the students would benefit from this education as before. 
to enhance teaching and learning in medical education anytime, anywhere, uh, may offer new opportunities to the students, I think now, especially with uh, remote uh, or distance learning. Uh, blended learning is any educational strategy that features both digital and traditional teaching methods together to help the students learn. Um, but it may take some time really to uh, do this in, a, in proficiency and properly uh, because both the students and the educators, the faculty members, need to adopt to this system uh, in very short time. In this paper, Go has uh, given some aspects on the transformative changes with medical education after COVID. He claimed that there is a need to align various contributory factors uh, of the learning uh, and instructional technology, the learning objectives, learning content, uh, the design, the technology, the context. Uh, many educators would require further development and uh, training for effective use of technology, development of emergent technology for teaching and learning, unfortunately, is costly, um, especially now with the world's economical crisis, or especially in Turkey, I would say. This, how I don't know how we can really manage the cost of this using this emergent technology. For this, maybe we could overcome this by using open education resources as well in medical education. But stress that really we need to work on a new curriculum or uh, redesign our curriculum uh, to meet the needs of the society more properly. Um, one important issue is related to the uh, to the schools where they have to meet the health needs of the society. And in recent years, social accountability have become very popular and in front line. I think the schools should become socially accountable related to education, research, and services uh, in many aspects so they could really serve uh, the society in a better way. We should consider preventive medicine significantly, uh, mainly covering the pandemic management and medical practices in the pandemic. We should integrate social medicine significantly in the program besides basic sciences and clinical sciences. Use emergent technology, but I would stress that we should use this rationally and we should teach telemedicine to the students as well because this, in the COVID period, the use of telemedicine has increased significantly in, in amount. And in the future, this would be used maybe routinely as well. So we should teach uh, telemedicine in our medical curriculum as well. This paper, I, which I like very much really, is a, a more like an editorial viewpoint paper by uh, Catherine Lucy from uh, University of California. Uh, who was the president of ABIM for a period, she has uh, declared that there were some themes which emerged with the transformational effects of COVID-19. And she summarized these themes in five main topics, as the first one being the support of a robust public health response to the pandemic is important. Uh, adoption of a curriculum to current issues in real time is important. Uh, to graduate a class of well-prepared physicians each year during the pandemic on time and without lowering the standards. As being, you know, currently at least, uh, the presiding and accrediting agency, I think uh, this is very important. You know, we need to continue our education with the same high standards that we, we, do, we would like to see in medical education uh, and timely without uh, any uh, compensatory effects. Protect limited education resources and treat, uh, le treat the learners equitably. equitably. Each student uh, should be equal in learning. Uh, and the last is to engage in crisis communication 
an active change. We have to be prepared for the future, for any other crisis like COVID-19, which may have, still may affect our education in the future and get lessons from this. Uh, we have to pray to prepare the students for new approaches, train the educators about the emerging technology and teaching and learning. Uh, and here we have to keep in mind that there are services of medical education that cannot be replaced by all my resources. And mainly the clinical competencies are these which we need to certainly compensate with some other measures as well in medical education. What happened in Turkey shortly, the response of the schools to COVID-19 uh, has been parallel to the actions universally or globally. Face-to-face -face education, both in preclinical and clinical phases were suspended to start with. An emergency remote education approach was introduced. I, I'm stressing on this, that we should not really take this as a program and this is only an emergency remote education, which requires to the normal tract of medical education. But now in 21, 22, the winter or uh, fall winter, face to face uh, with certain measures uh, was instituted in Turkey and started now to be, to be given. Now, as the accrediting agency in Turkey, we thought that we need to support the students and the faculties and School of Medicines at the same time during this pandemic. For the students, we prepared an emergency program or as given online course on COVID-19, where we had almost 9,000 registers and 8,000 completed this course and the course uh, at the end of the course, they were, they, are, they were certified after answering the uh, questions related to evaluation. The program is still on the website, which could be used uh, in Turkey. It's Turkish, unfortunately. Uh, that could be used to teach the students on uh, various aspects of COVID-19 and uh, uh, management. Now, supporting the medical schools, what we did was we shared recommendations from the early part with the medical schools of education in the pandemic. We sent them three general documents where program management and approaches were discussed uh, during the pandemic. Medical education, the clinical clerkship and internship was covered in one document. And in other document, medical education, the preclinical years was covered. And the fifth, uh, the sixth, uh, declaration was related to assessment and evaluation in medical education to the schools. How, I mean, guiding the schools really uh, during this process and trying to at least uh, um, eliminate some of the anxiety uh, of the parties in medical education. Then we asked for reports from the schools, uh, what measures were taken, what were the challenges and what were the plans for the future uh, in medical education? And recently we conducted a questionnaire at the end of uh, last year's uh, second semester fiscal, fiscal years, which I will give you some of the preliminary results already. Uh, the plans for the future by the schools uh, were summarized as short-term plans, improving the technological infrastructure for online teaching, implementing more interactive methods that would increase the effectiveness and efficiency of online teaching. I think these were some of the important challenges of the schools. Compensate practical and clinical training that could be done during the pandemic. On midterm, they stated that they will plan on faculty development, uh, the vision of the education program creates safe teaching environments for face-to-face -face education, include health needs of the society in the program, as I discussed earlier, social accountability, for example. And in long term, they propose developing a national policies for online teaching in medicine 
and include the emerging technology to the medical education process rationally. I think these are really very good plans which will work on them for the future in medical education in Turkey. Uh, what we shared, as I said, a questionnaire with all medical schools with the aim was mainly to evaluate the status of medical education during the pandemic, especially in TEPTAT accredited programs, because it, we were responsible to those medical schools more common than the other schools. Uh, and we received uh, responses from 59 schools of which included all of the accredited programs. So all of the accredited programs responded to this questionnaire. I'd like to thank them here. I will come off the preliminary results because it's a big study, which we are now preparing the report of this study, which we will share with the medical schools and the current state and for the future. One of the points that we wanted to find out is whether there were any directives defined for education in the, pan in the pandemic, what was going to be done. And as you could see in the first phase, only 71% of the schools had these directives, but later this increased to about 90%. So they prepared some directives on their, what they were going to do during the pandemic uh, related to medical education and made it public to the school. Uh, we asked them whether they gave any training to the students about online education, Again, in the initial phase, it was 93%, which increased to 100% second term. But the third term, we were becoming more normalized, and this was about 90%. Did we asked them whether they gave any training to the faculty members about online education. And again, again, this was 29, 25%. In the second semester, it reached 98% and the third semester, 88%. Uh, clinical clerkships uh, were 56% conducted initially. Then the second term, it was 76%. And now this year, it's 95%, the first semester. Uh, we asked them whether they had any compensation courses for the activities which were suspended. And in the first, semester, it was only 73%, but in the second semester, they compensated about 80%, but the schools compensated in about 80% of the uh, activities. Uh, we asked them whether they had any done for assessment. And again, here, it was about 90% where the schools had adjustments for um, uh, assessment and evaluation system. We asked them whether they gave any trial online exams to the students. And this was first 83%, which decreased over to 63% at the third uh, semester. Student counseling, uh, in the first semester, it was our 70%, but this increased to 80 to 83% in the schools. Uh, we asked them whether they got student feedback, very, you could see that it was initially 85%, but then increased to 96% and 93 or 94%. Because in our uh, documents that we shared with them, recommendations, this in included getting student feedback for the, student, for the uh, medical schools. We asked them about the faculty members' feedback. Again, 66% increased to about 80%. We asked them whether the students were involved in the decisions taken for education, which we think was very important to include the students in these decisions because they were really in a high anxiety what's going to happen to them this pandemic. And again, this increased from 73% to about 88% at the end. Education program on COVID, about 90 to 93% of the schools had some sort of education program. Some of them used our TEPTAT uh, program uh, for, the, for their COVID-19 education. So I'd like to complete my talk on uh, 
some issues which I think are important, which became more important during the COVID pandemic. And that was, I based this on uh, the Carnegie Foundation for Advancement of Teaching uh, report in 2010, uh, during the 100 years of Flexner's report uh, being evaluated. And they said the future demands new approaches to shaping the minds, the hands, and the hearts of the physicians. I think we see these, that how much they are important now during the pandemic itself, because the medical education really covers knowledge, where you should use your brain, skills using the hands, and behavior using your heart. I think we need to teach these to the students with at a level of competency, so they would practice future medicine with their brain, hands, and with their heart for the patients. Uh, we need to rethink how the new generation learn and make necessary changes in medical education to prepare uh, future physicians. I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you want to find more information. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Professor Sayek. Uh, uh, the discussion will be uh, done at the end after all talks. Uh, so now it is a great pleasure for me to give the floor to Professor Osam Hamdi, the Chancellor of uh, Gulf Medical University uh, is uh, uh, very briefly, uh, Professor Hamdi is a pediatric surgeon and professor of surgery. Uh, his work and contribution to medicine and medical education over 40 years has been acknowledged and has won him many awards. Fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of England in 2010, Honorary Fellow of the Association for Medical Education in Europe in 2021. He became the very first recipient of the Health Worker Recognition Award conferred by Eastern Mediterranean Regional Office of World Health Organization in 2021. Additionally, he is also a member of the World Federation for Medical Education Assessors Team. So please, uh, Professor Hamdi, uh, the floor is yours. Aiza, for giving me this opportunity to be with these distinguished friends and colleagues uh, uh, today. Uh, the presentation, the first presentation by Dr. Semra, and of course the presentation of Professor Iskander, uh, actually were wonderful presentation because whatever I'm going to talk, it, it makes sense, it continue on the line of thoughts and ideas which they have presented. I'm taking a position in my presentation that the changes were happening before the COVID. And then the COVID came as an event. And then the, what's going to happen after the COVID, the transformation, which Dr. Sa Dr. Iskander has mentioned it, uh, uh, how, how the future of medical education will look like. And the second message, which I am trying to uh, share it with you, that the health medical education is inseparable from the healthcare system of the country uh, where it is uh, uh, given. So the healthcare systems are changing, so eventually and should the medical education should also change. Not only medical education, but all health professional education. And then the changes which are happening in the healthcare systems, how this will be transforming the medical education, which is a major paradigm shift, which many issues related to it were presented uh, by the, my two friends, the previous presenters. And then I would share with you some views about uh, what's going to happen in the future if we can predict something about the future. I like very much what uh, 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 this philosopher, French philosopher, uh, Alain Badieu, describing an event that it has the power to rupture standard practices and approved knowledge 
disclosing heightened ability to think and act. So nothing, it's, it's a wonderful description of what happened uh, due to COVID and the effect of COVID as an event in our life. And as it was presented, I think February, March, 2020, I considered the point of no return to the education system of the past. We're not talking only about distance learning, synchronous, asynchronous, but I am talking about the whole educational system uh, is going to change and is changing. And as you can see, when saying medical education is inseparable from the healthcare system, but not only the system, but the economic, political, social, and cultural systems around it, it's affected and it, uh, by, by, by all these systems. And some of the disruptive forces of change in the healthcare system, definitely all the advances which are happening in medical knowledge, science, and practice, the new technology for diagnosis and treatment, the changing in the demography of the population. Uh, the patients are better educated. They all have gone to Google before coming to see you. The informatics and big data analytics, which becoming part of our life, and the domino effect, the global health, which we have seen it, whether starting in China to affect the whole world after that. And then the new healthcare systems, which will be evolving. Uh, an important issue is that the delivery of care will be definitely beyond the walls of the hospitals, and this is happening everywhere. Uh, uh, so ambulatory care, home care, and telemedicine. Uh, yesterday, I wanted uh, to repeat some prescription for my medication. Uh, I received it at home. Uh, so uh, things are changing. And the Healthcare system science, the changes have an implication to medical education. And this is a very important thing that healthcare will be dependent on a team, not the individual healthcare provider, not the physician, not the nurse separately from the physician. And that's why it's going to become very important that the interprofessional education which I call it learning together, uh, in the learning context is for preparing them for working together, the practice context. And this is an important feature of how the healthcare system will influence the education. Uh, I, I am a big believer in academic healthcare systems. And medical education institutes as educational system will integrate with the healthcare system, transforming and developing them into academic healthcare centers. Uh, actually, this would be the norm, not the exception. The, you may have an institution, academia representing university. It may have a, a university hospital, but what about other hospitals? Do they talk together? Do they integrate together? And I believe that uh, university hospitals or government hospitals will not be sufficient for the training of the health workforce of the future. And I think this model of how to move from what I call them the capital I to an edge up into a, and to some to a great extent an integrated system is very important. But you have we all understand. A lot of organizational culture change, changes has to take place. I believe that the private sector, uh, I don't know how many uh, uh, private medical schools are uh, or, uh, uh, in, in Turkey, but we cannot say they are not very good or the private hospitals are only for uh, profit. I think the system will come up of how to integrate public-private partnership, which will spread, of course, to be regulated. And the training of students should be in all healthcare-related facilities in the community. We are talking about, uh, Dr. Iskander, he mentioned the community-based uh, and the community responsibility and the engagement. 
And I think this should be not only for the university and in the university hospital, but it has to spread uh, uh, in, in, in all healthcare facilities in a community or in a country. Now, the impact, again, as Professor Iskander has mentioned, will be on everything. So the new curriculum, which we have to change, and we all understand everything is context dependent. One size does not fit all. We cannot imagine that there is one best type of curriculum which can be applied to all medical colleges globally. In America, the four plus four, in other places, two plus four, one plus five. Sometimes it reminds me of football when they say they play, how they're going to organize the team. But everything is related to the context. Uh, this model of having the basic sciences in the first two, three years, and then the clinical sciences in the last two years, which is how they did all the two, what we call the two pillars models, uh, has to change. But still it exists, till now. And we all are talking now about uh, competency-based education. And in competence-based education, what is course-based need to be changed to competency-based. It is not how much the graduate knows by accumulating credits, but is, is he fit for the purpose? What the graduate is able to do? So this concept has to be, we have to reflect how this can influence the structure of what we are doing. Uh, the integration of the curriculum and PBL, TBL, all this, I started this in 1979. So it's more than 40 years, but still this line of demarcation between the basic medical science and clinical science is still rigid and we do our best to break it down. And we move more trying to, to break the boundaries between them. And I am a very big believer into the early uh, introduction of clinical practice or exposing the students to the workplace very early following the theory of community of practice theory of Fenger and Love. I think this is one of the models which will come up uh, from now on, on. And as you can see, this model is based on, uh, it is a competency based, but it goes at a higher level, including the interest ability. It is based on four, you can consider it five pillars of course, the basic medical science, the clinical science, but it's important to introduce systems and social sciences. And I am a big believer, like what Professor Skander has mentioned, that medicine is a social science. And then, of course, research and innovation, but you can see cutting across all these pillars, technology and data sciences. So all this has to be uh, introduced according to the way the context allow you to do it uh, in our new types of curricula. Of course, the students are changing and they have changed uh, the, the technatives. They are used maybe uh, to distance learning now after going through the COVID, what, the COVID effect of what happens. Uh, so the students will be learning and working in teams with other health professionals. We have to encourage this, the interprofessional education and practice. The, and as I mentioned before, they have to be exposed to the workplace. Research and innovation has to start from day one, year one, and continue vertically in the curriculum. The faculty will change. Now we have faculty, uh, uh, you expect from them to do everything, but they are moving now from being information giver to facilitator of learning, role model, expert, innovator, I think, uh, Professor Ron Harden has described this many years ago. Uh, faculty track system, we have developed in our university, uh, it's three tracks, the basic, the medical, uh, the educator track, the researcher track, and the clinical track. And it varies, the 80-20 variations will vary from each one. It's not exactly 80-20, but just to give an idea that if you want a good researcher, they should be spending more time in doing research and so on. The faculty workload, we still calculate faculty workload basing on teaching load, which I don't like it very much. And they, we keep counting the load, is it 12 credit and also on. 
we are moving or we should be moving more to what is called the educational load rather than the teaching, which carry the well, teaching means that giving a lecture or uh, something similar to that. New knowledge, again, many things has to be going into the curriculum on the expense uh, of, of, of not to develop what was described as curriculum hypertrophy. Uh, uh, so precision medicine, they have to introduce to that, genetics, molecular medicine, uh, global health, health economics, social medicine, uh, leadership, management, entrepreneurship, healthcare system sciences. So how to introduce these new sciences and new knowledge in our curriculum on the expense of what? All these issues which we have to discuss them. The new technology, of course, has professionals function will be enhanced, not replaced by technology. The hospitals will be uh, 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 full of technology which is taking place now, artificial intelligence and machine learning, robotics, data analytics, informatics, innovation, all these are new technology. The students are founding it around them. So that we have to introduce this in our uh, curriculum. They're not going to be software engineers, but they have to understand all this new technology and particularly the ethical issues related to it. So as you can see, uh, at present, all, all these technologies are around us. It was before, during, and after the COVID. Uh, we have developed, we've had this, for example, uh, high fidelity AI based simulation, the virtual patient learning, uh, where we were running our problem based learning based on this type of simulation. So when we, during the COVID, we were able to use it. Uh, even from a distance. Uh, so the PBL were conducted uh, using the technology which is accessible and available uh, uh, to, to, conduct, to conduct it online, but using uh, this AI high fidelity uh, simulator. Just to give you an idea of the authenticity. It's severe. And I've been having difficulty breathing. And the students interact with the patient and the patient respond uh, uh, to them. And it can be used in the PBL pre, pre clerkship phase and in the clerkship. It woke me from sleep early this morning around 4.30. I also woke up feeling sweaty and having difficulty breathing. Uh, even during the COVID, uh, uh, we were able to use this simulator for assessment of non-psychomotor clinical competencies like reasoning, decision-making, communication, using this virtual uh, clinical encounter examination, which we published it in, uh, uh, early this year. I regularly self-examine my breasts after my period. Um, once a month since I was 32. I'm now 35, so I've been checking them for three years. Uh, just to give you an idea about it, and, uh, and now what we are doing is that we are introducing technology and data science as a, a program, as a vertically trans in the curriculum from year one, uh, so three levels, an introductory course level, and in level two, it is more advanced, and level three goes more into health informatics, application, AI, and so on. So we are learning from this, and perhaps we can share our experience with you, and we can collaborate in developing uh, this in our uh, uh, curriculum. Now, the new assessment system, uh, we are measuring outcome competence, or we should be measuring outcome competence at different levels of students' progression, and measuring competence at the entrustable professional activities. So the community will ask, can I trust him or her? It is not about only the grades in the exam. And this, uh, the programmatic assessment, which has been described with, by our friend, Kiswander Newton and Lambert Schubert and others. 
We use the port electronic portfolio because in order to have evidence of what is happening uh, and, and the competency competencies of the students, this has to be captured uh, uh, in a portfolio because this it will reflect who, who am I when you go and, and, and how can we trust you? Uh, so all these things were happening before, but it were accelerated and it was it were useful during the COVID and we continue to be further developed in the post-COVID era. And now uh, 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 with particularly having Professor Skandar heading the accreditation, uh, Turkish Accreditation Commission, uh, I think uh, accreditation uh, and quality assurance will change or should change to accommodate what is happening and what will happen and should drive the changes. And I have some sensitivity about the credit hour systems and which was developed 100 years ago. Uh, it needs to be revisited how we measure uh, quality, how we measure education. So instead of the time-based education, it would be replaced by the trust-based education. Uh, and, and we have to think how this will be uh, uh, taken in consideration by the accreditation bodies uh, in each country. Uh, so the accreditation bodies should adapt to changes and lead the transformation. So transformative quality assurance system, and this lead, needs definitely leadership, visionary leadership, and faculty development programs. Now, my last point, can we predict what will happen in the post-COVID era? Very difficult. But the transformation is fast, fast, and it needs this transformative leadership. And medical education should always be contextual, adapted, and flexible, because we don't know something else may come, but how we adapt and how we be more flexible in our programs, in how we teach and how we develop and how we structure the universities. So with medicine becoming increasingly high tech, training on compassionate humanistic medicine becomes essential. Machine will not replace human, but will definitely enable them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hamdi, for this uh, very inspiring uh, presentation. And now I, we continue with the discussion. Uh, Rumeza, would you like to start? Yes, I, I'll start with, Professor Hamdi's uh, comment about asking the number of private uh, schools of medicine in Turkey. Let me just give the numbers. Maybe Professor Sayek or uh, Özçelik will correct me. As far as I know, we have 104 medical schools, including the states and the private uh, universities in the country, and 32 of them are private universities. But some of the universities have two programs, be it them the Turkish curriculum taught uh, schools of medicine and the other ones are English uh, taught uh, medical faculties. But uh, commenting about, you were talking about the academic healthcare centers. These are the norms, not the exceptions. This Tuesday, we had a discussion, panel discussion at the Higher Board of Education in Ankara. And the discussion was, should the um, private universities own their hospitals and we were for the side for voting for it and promoting having a hospital within the campus of the university to make sure that the students are readily available to the patient, patient care, other healthcare providers, and also hearing about or learning about the campus life and their peer uh, students to make sure that they're going to uh, improve their uh, skills in terms of being a part of the team, actually. That's also critical. Yes, the machines are not hopefully replace the human. They will enable us, but we still need to be working within the teams, especially thinking about the social medicine and the public health, and especially running through these disasters like the pandemic or the unknown disasters that we might encounter in the near future. So uh, that was my comment about the things that you have said. And can I ask, now I have another question targeted to Professor uh, Sayek. And he mentioned about per personalized learning, extended reality, anytime, anywhere. 
But the question is about where is the limit or is there a limit to this anywhere, anytime education? We sort of became uh, Zoom fatigued. That's the term that has been used in some of the latest papers. But is it like gonna be 24 hours of learning for seven days or is should be a limit to uh, where we can learn and how we can learn? Thank you. Dr. Rameza, thank you very much for the question. It's uh, very important, really. You know, I, we need really to uh, adjust the time of learning uh, at a proper level. You know, you cannot leave it unlimited. Unfortunately, I mean, not unfortunately, but it's uh, it's not proper on educational uh, physiology uh, or the human being physiology. You know, so. We have to be very careful there, you know, about how much we are going to give uh, for teaching anywhere and anytime, you know. But I think that's a good philosophy for especially this new generation, you know. The, because they, I mean, they learn very different than what I used to learn, how I used to learn, you know, or how, how I used to study. I still take everything on paper, you know, I try to read it on paper, but they can read it very easily from their iPad or from their iPhone, you know, but uh, which, so we have, we have to really balance that very properly, I think, you know. Luciano, is there any comment from your side? Yeah. Oh, Let's hear your perspective too, uh, from all Italy. Three, all three talks, uh, uh, they were very uh, interesting and inspiring. I mean, uh, I agree with many uh, statements, very interesting. Uh, really like the one uh, uh, minds, uh, hands and hearts of uh, physicians, you know, to be actually taken care of and improved now in this uh, post-COVID era. This is uh, also great. And also when it was mentioned that medicine indeed is a social science. So, I mean, uh, there, are, there were many, many interesting, uh, you know, points that uh, unfortunately we, we will not have time to Go back to all of that, but in general, I mean, uh, um, I want to ask the panelists. Uh, now I think uh, the COVID uh, crisis pushed us uh, very significant, significantly in this uh, direction of digitalization. So many things that we are doing are not completely new. I mean, they've been debated before, they've been uh, discussed, but of course there was a very significant push. Uh, one of the issues I think that we have is that, of course, uh, the curriculum medicine is very strictly regulated in most of the countries. So uh, in many countries, I think after the crisis, many things that were possible <laughs> during the crisis, like, you know, uh, making uh, possible to students uh, to uh, be assessed online, to learn online, in many cases will not be possible anymore. So. What are your views about that? I mean, what can we do as universities, you know, in different countries to try to go back to a new normal in which, you know, we will uh, benefit? Uh, I mean, uh, this, of course, has been a tragedy for, for the world, but let's try at least to, uh, you know, to uh, make some use of the lessons learned. So are you optimistic or pessimistic or which are the strategies that we can use to go back to a new normal, which will be better than the previous situation? Uh, can I take this? Yes, <laughs> Professor Hamdi, go ahead. Well, uh, I think I think there, is, as I, as I've said, there will be no new normal. There will be the normal. So we are not going to go back to anything as this was the normal because things has changed and will continue to change. But how fast they're going to change? That's the new normal. If uh, uh, we 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 use this expression. Uh, so we, we, we have to, to start thinking uh, differently that all aspects related to medical education has to be revised because we will, not, we will never go back to exactly what we were doing before. Uh, definitely things will be still continuing, but they are in the process of change. 
So the systems has to be ready to change. And when I talk about systems, it has to be systems of healthcare and systems of medical education. So the discussion between in the universities and at the higher level, it is not how we can go back exactly to the past, but how we are going to go forward with all the implications related to that from organizational structure. I imagine, for example, even the departmental structure, the traditional departmental structure will change, will be more related if you are talking about a competency-based education and vertical themes in the curriculum, maybe the department, there will be a department of ethics and professionalism. There will be a department of technology and innovation. Uh, uh, there will be, so all these uh, issues uh, are fundamental and major changes which has to happen uh, in, the, in medical education. Last point, which I think Professor Saif has mentioned it in, about the costs related uh, to the, the technology, not technology, but to the resources, I think, and how they are expensive and so on. I totally agree with you. And I think we should move of how we can, as universities, that's the advantage of this webinar that you have allowed us to come together. Uh, the three universities which are sitting together today, and if there are more listening, how we can build on that and collaborate and share our resources with other colleagues' resources, how we can share our question, part of our question banks, how we can share technology which we have, that the future uh, is going to be. And by doing this, we really are going to support each other and move forward and it, we, we are all going to, to win. Uh, Dr. Remeza, can I comment? Dude, it's, uh, yes. uh, it's very, uh, what Dr. Sasso has mentioned is very important. And I fully agree with Dr. Hamdi, mainly related to the issue that uh, medical education and health system relationship, you know. Now, uh, Charles Berlin from WHO years ago, maybe two or three dec decades ago, he said that, if you want to be successful in medical education, you have to do the changes parallel to the health system and to the health policies of that country. I mean, if you just change one of them, it's impossible for the others to be successful. You know? And even for the first one, even to, to be successful. So we have to think more, uh, more integrated with the healthcare system and health policies the, and health needs of the society. That's why I stress our social accountability. You know. Social accountability is a very general uh, topic which covers education, research, and services and gives the, the schools a, a good way to go forward for the future of medical education. Uh, in Turkey, we have, in TEPTAT again, we had a, a study where we defined uh, the uh, uh, criteria for social accountability for the Turkish medical schools specifically. Uh, and I think that the schools can benefit from these for, for the future, you know. Uh, the other issue is related to uh, uh, medical education for the future. I. I fully agree again with Dr. Hamdi that uh, we have to think more on health professional education uh, as the umbrella for medical education. And that's why interprofessional education is very important for, for our party. And we have to include in our program, uh, especially interprofessional education uh, for team-based uh, activities for the future, because without the team, the physician alone will not be able to do anything, unfortunately, for the future. So maybe we should think more globally on health professional education. And within that, the medical education should take its share and lead, lead the issue related to interprofessional education 
with other uh, fields of health professionals uh, as well. Uh, and the other, uh, again, which has mentioned really uh, as being, uh, we should not think more on time-based and we should uh, really uh, move from that because, I mean, you can say that medical education is six years, but it doesn't mean anything, I think. Or uh, surgery is five years, it doesn't mean anything unless you meet the, uh, your aims and your objectives um, and uh, prepare the graduates with a high competency level, that period is, doesn't mean anything really. Maybe it may take nine, nine years, who knows, for a, for a, for a person to become uh, more uh, competent uh, in this field. Well, thank you very much for this nice webinar and uh, uh, I hope we uh, will benefit from the talks here. Thank you. Thank you too, Professor Sayek. And I think we are reaching the end. Before we end, I would like to comment about your uh, wording and mentioning about the workload of all health uh, providers, including our postgraduate students, residents, or fellows uh, who were the workforce during the pandemic. And of course it altered their education team, but they learned a lot throughout this process. That's what I believe because you uh, cherish throughout the disasters. You learn a way to deal with the tasks which you weren't exposed to priorly and it uh, improves you faster than you think. L look at us, we have improved our online education. So what uh, then we have taught previously, well, we were just, you know, uh, taking small steps, but we had to take bigger steps. And we're now discussing with Professor Hamdi's suggestions. We will not have the normal anymore, the old normal. We're gonna have the new standards actually, not the new uh, norms, but new standards. And it's, uh, I totally agree. It's with the competencies rather than the lectures and the other things. And they have to be competent enough to serve the community where they live but also where they don't live. They have to serve the uh, global community to make sure that we have better lives. And Sasso, please. Yes, I also want to thank very much uh, the speakers uh, for their very inspiring, very interesting talks. Uh, I think uh, I mean, this topic is uh, really complex. And uh, of course, in a, in a short webinar, it's not possible to, to completely uh, talk about everything, but it, uh, I think we gave uh, to the audience, uh, very good ideas, you know, to be developed. So many thanks again to the speakers. Uh, thank you to you, Romeza, for organizing this. And again, I think let's go back to this topic in the near future because I think we need to talk again and there are many other issues, including, uh, there is no time now, but I wanted to actually ask a, a, a another point to the speakers related to the internal challenges. Because we, uh, I, I mentioned first the external challenges, I mean, the regulation of the curriculum, but also internally, when we want to change things, uh, it's not easy, I mean, that we know in academia. So <laughs> that's another topic, I think, for another webinar. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for being with us. And thanks to my distinguished uh, speakers and co-chair and hope to see you at another webinar soon. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye, Dan. Bye. Let's keep in touch as much as possible. <laughs> bye, bye, yes, Dan. indeed.